Welcome to The Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. And follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. In a moment, we're going to get into today's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The original air date will be March the 14th of 1950, and the title is 85 Little Makes. First, though, a word from our sponsors. Today's episode of The Great Detectives of Old Time Radio is brought to you by the Old Time Radio Mystery, Suspense, and Horror Podcast. Uh, This podcast features old-time radio plays of the mystery, suspense, and horror genres. The host, Dakota, uses his background in audio engineering to clean up and enhance the quality of the plays. Dakota also shares insightful background information about the actors and actresses. The show is available on most of the podcast platforms, such as uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Android, Spreaker, CastBox, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Podbean, and many others. Uh, And uh, you can check out Old Time Radio Mystery, Suspense, and Horror Podcast at your preferred podcast provider. All right. Well, let's go ahead and take a listen now to yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the 85 Little Makes. I'm now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Get out of bed and get your gum shoes on, Johnny. You're going to be busy. Who's this? Ed Bonner, and I'm calling you from Hartford. Heard you were in Boston this week. Get over to the Elwood Faber department store right away. Oh, call me later, Ed. Would you? It's still 8 o'clock Look, in the morning. Look, we got $300,000 worth of liability insurance on their fur department. Sure, sure, later. Now they haven't got a fur department anymore. Just had 85 minks stolen. What? <laughs> Edmund O'Brien, in another transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Mr. Ed Bonner, Mutual Liability Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during investigation of burglary affecting policy issued to Elwood Faber Department Store, Boston, Massachusetts, or the 85 Little Minks. Expense account. Item. $1.90. Taxi fare to Stewart Street entrance of Elwood Faber Department Store, where a police emergency ambulance was standing open. Two police officers were helping a man in a white coat load a blanket-wrapped figure onto the ambulance litter. I got my first information from the intern. Ah, what's up? Oh, I only worked the wagon. I pick up where everything else left off. This guy's name's Cronin. He's a night watchman here. Dead? Oh, about an inch away. We already gave him a transfusion upstairs. If the bullets don't kill him, the exposure will. What does that mean? Besides holes in his chest, he's also got frostbite. Somebody plugged him, let him lay in the cold storage vault where they keep the furs. How long ago? Oh, who knows? All right, Percy, wind it up. Let's get out of here. Come on. A sordid group of reporters and cameramen seemed to be converging toward a freight elevator just inside the store entrance. I converged with them, and we all rode up to the fifth floor where two plainclothesmen from burglary detail stopped us. I showed my ID card, argued for five minutes, and finally got a frown and a thumb jerk. I walked across 35 yards of expensive carpeting through a cubbyhole office door into a large room. Standing in front of a huge refrigerated vault was a tall man in a black Stetson. His name was Delaney. We shook hands. Quite a thing, Dollar. Some guys walked out of here last night with 85 mink coats. It's a mess. You got a cigarette? Yeah, sure. Here you are. Thanks. The store's going to be closed all day while the burglary squad goes over it with everything they got. You can do what you have to do, too. Thanks, Lieutenant. I appreciate that. What do you figure? Freight elevator or stairs? Either or both. I don't know. They must have had a panel truck or a big limo in that alley. Yeah, I noticed that on my way up. 
It'd keep any car hidden from the street, and they'd be able to work without being bothered. I got a man coming down to check for tire tracks, but it won't do any good. Whoever they were, they did it quiet, and they did it neat. Neat? Yeah. But quiet? Uh, you mean that night watchman, Cronin? Well, there must have been some noise when he walked into them and got shot. I hope he lives to tell us something. He's in tough shape. How about this? The vault? Just like the banks have, only smaller. And they can also hang meat in it. Not pried or blasted or cut into, just plain old-fashioned tumbler work. Sandpapered fingers and all, That huh? wouldn't surprise me. Somebody was plenty good. Not even marks of a jimmy or pry tool to feel an edge. Just picked and plucked as nice as you please, and 14 little tumblers fell back. The door swung open. I thought that kind of thing stopped with Jimmy Valentine. Yeah, so did I. Who reported it? A guy named Dmitri Stroganoff, manager of the fur department. Come on. He's in his office now giving a statement to a couple of my boys. You can have a listen in. There's your pigeon, Donna. Eighty of you. Something happened to Dmitri Stroganoff. Aha! Lieutenant Delahanne. Uh, Mr. Stroganoff, this is Mr. Dollar. He represents your insurance company. Oh, oh your acquaintanceship, Mr. Dollar, above all else I am glad to make. Aha! Eighty-five mean coats, valued at three hundred thousand dollars, coin of the realm. You have, of course, brought check for fame, yes? Uh, no. What? The adjuster will do that, Mr. Stroganoff. I'm an investigator, but don't worry, you... Week by week, month by month, 14 years, I get two words from the insurance company. Two words, pay premium. Now it's Stroganoff's turn to say back his two words. Pay Stroganoff. Believe me, Mr. Stroganoff, your money's waiting for you in a vault in a bank in Hartford where nobody can get it but you. Waltz, ba, ba, pa. I suppose you go right on with your statement, Mr. Stroganoff. Uh, We have to have it, you know. Why is my aid for mink in this direction? I answer you. Customer telephones Friday. Send over mink coat right away, she says. I send. Night comes, she wears coat to party. To breakfast next morning, she's also wearing coat, maybe eggs she's eating. To party Saturday and to cocktail Sunday also. Monday? Aha! My husband does not like coat. I'm sending back, she says. Mink! Real tough, Mr. Stroganoff. You can never tell what people will do next. I, Dmitry Stroganov, can tell. Look, if you'll just answer a few questions... This morning, even as I arise, comes to me a feeling of doom. Yes. Yes. Well, now about... Something is going to happen bad, I said to myself. And when I get here, no, no, even before I get here, I slip and fall. No, no, even before that, parking ticket for too long past. No, no, even before that... He went on like that for quite a while, and the police stenographer took down every word. His whole testimony typed up into 23 single-spaced pages, but only the following was of any use. Stroganoff arrived at the store at approximately 8.45, found the vault door open, and inside the wounded watchman Cronin, also the mink coats gone. Stroganoff notified insurance company, Stroganoff notified police in that order. Expense account, item. $1.35 $1.35 for two ham sandwiches, two bottles of beer, all of which I shared with Lieutenant Delaney and Stroganoff's office. All kinds of heist. Jewels, trucks, cars, banks. But this is the best so far. A real 14 carat double breasted A number one dilly. That's what it is, Dollar. How'd they get in that safe? They just opened it up and walked in the same way you walk in your own front door, Lieutenant. Yeah, but how? Who's that good? Who? Well, there's the, the creepy kid. They always say he's that good. You and me both know Creepy died 12 years ago at Dunamore. And, uh, and there was Dancing Dan Marathon. Dancing Dan? He couldn't open a two-bit padlock if he had the key. Who is good, Johnny? Who could do it? I wish I knew. <sighs> Stroganoff's the only one in the store who knows the combo. The only one. You know what I don't know. But you aren't taking any chances. Didn't I see two of you men tail him out of here? You bet your life you didn't. And by the way... Didn't you put in a call to your office and have him checked on? You bet your life I did. Eh, cop work. All the time we got... Delaney. Yeah. Yeah, hi, Richie. Well, give it to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, thanks. Hospital, though. The night watchman? Cronin died ten minutes ago without saying a word. Mm-hmm. I was hoping he'd be able to fill in some gaps. Hmm. Well, he does. At least one. Which one? The other watchman's story about playing the radio. Yeah. 
What other watchman? Al Reedy. Oh, I'm sorry, Dollar. Maybe you passed him on. Well, tell me about him. Was he shot too? No, 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 no. We questioned him first thing this morning. You see, Cronin made the rounds, and Reedy held down the office. Reedy didn't know nothing about anything last night. He was listening to his radio in his office downstairs. What gap does that fill? And Doc says Cronin got it with a thirty-two. Let it fit. They don't make much noise, and a man leaning into a radio close. Reedy, huh? Well, where can I find him? Right here. He's waiting in the locker room. Why, do you want to talk to him? Yeah. Mind? Oh, help yourself, Dollar. Thanks. Oh, Dollar. Yeah? You're looking for $300,000 worth of mink coats. I'm looking for a killer. Don't be a wise guy when you do your poking around, huh? I'll, uh... I'll try to keep my nose clean, Lieutenant. Yeah? Hello. You Al Reedy? You another cop? In a way, yeah. In what way? Insurance investigator. All right, Mr. Insurance Investigator. Am I supposed to tell you something that'll tip the whole thing? No, Mr. Night Watchman. You're just supposed to tell me how things went for you last night. Swell. I sat in my office from 10 to 6, went home, went to bed. Got picked up by two big flat-footed coppers at 7.30. And here I am. How'd things go with you last night? You sound a little put out, Reedy. Or are you used to places being heisted where you work? What kind of a nasty crack is that? What'd you see in here last night while you were doing all your night watching? Nothing. No freight elevator moving? No. No sounds on the stairs? No. And you didn't hear the shots that plugged Cronin? No, I didn't. Why? Because I sit in my office and listen to disc jockeys. The radio's liable to smother a lot of noise. Wrong answer. Well, the cops like it. I don't. Give me a better one. I'll have to look for it. But I'll find it, mister. I'll show you. I'll show you. But you'll never find those guys who tromped off of those coats last night. You sound awful sure of that. I am. Because you'll spend all your time on someone like me, trying to make something out of nothing, just to show everybody how good you are. Reedy, if you're clean, you haven't got anything to worry about. Well, maybe, but answer me this. Who's going to say when a guy's clean? When he's right or wrong? A lot of filing cabinets in a building somewhere? Answer me, investigator. Who knows? Who's going to say? Ah, let me alone. Just let me alone. I didn't know what to make of Al Reedy, but I did know I wanted to know more about him. At the personnel office, I pulled out his application card. It looked good enough, and then I suddenly put it back. I had a hunch. And I headed for the Middleton Safe Company. The president and chief designer of the Middleton Safe Company was standing under a blue light in the center of a newly completed vault. He seemed lost in the huge room of shiny, gleaming metal all around him. Uh, please excuse me for not receiving you in my office, Mr. Dollar. Inspection day? <laughs> Something like that. Now, this one, this is what I call the big haze. Beautiful, isn't she? Completed a fortnight ago for a firm of South American bankers. You work on the safes and vaults yourself, Mr. Middleton. Indeed I do. The drama that captured me as a youth. To compose and weld and conform metal into an impregnable stronghold. Oh, it's fascinating, eh? Yes, yes, of course. Fine metal, case-hardened, perfectly alloyed Ohio steel. Strength, Mr. Dollar. Strength. But then I bore you, sir. <laughs> and now then, why are we meeting? So you can tell me something about safes and vaults, Mr. Middleton? Oh, I dare say I could, sir. But I'm afraid you'll have to be more specific. All right. Tell me... Tell me about the kind of vault you manufactured for the Elwood Faber Department store. A vault for... Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. The fur vault. Oh, yes, of course. What precisely do you wish to know about that vault? How someone could open it without knowing the combination. Oh, an impossible occurrence. Have you read the morning papers? Papers? What about them? That particular vault was opened last night and all the furs taken. Hey, well, what do you say? Looted? Well, that's impossible. It happened. That's why I'm here. Yeah, this is quite a... Sh oh, dear me, Mr. Dollar. Of course, you'll want a thorough account from my organization. Of course. And I shall be glad to furnish you with any information that might be helpful. I'd like to know how the combination was set and who knows it. But I'd have to know the serial numbers on that particular vault. Yeah, try these. Oh, well... You're a very efficient man, Mr. Dollar. I see you've jotted them down. Well, let's go up to my office and look them up. Oh, no. No, no, sir. That won't be necessary. I recognize these serials. D-4536. Oh, D. 
Well, D stands for Dana, and Mr. Dana set the final combination. Mr. Dana? Uh, my chief engineer for years. And who else besides him would know it? Myself and the person in proper authority at Elwood Faber, of course. Well, that would be strong enough. Anyone else here? No, sir. I'd like to talk to Mr. Dana, then. Well, I'm afraid that's quite impossible, sir. Oh? Albert Dana has been dead for seven years. Up to and including that point, I had a whole lot of nothing to go on. But by the time I got back to Boylston Street, heading for my hotel, things began to happen. A police car pulled up at the curb, and a familiar Stetson on top of a familiar head leaned out of the window. Hey, Dollar, you. Yeah, hello, Delaney. Hop in. Just come by to get you. I, uh, thought you might be interested in a guy. What guy? The one we found floating down the Charles River an hour ago. Who is he? I don't know. But it looked like he's got the same enemies as a night watchman named Cronin. Huh? Yeah. There were two thirty-two slugs in him. We wouldn't have picked it so fast, only that's the second pair been through ballistics in one day. And they match? Like your two front teeth. The same gun killed the night watchman and the guy in the river. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first, it's a family night on the Bing Crosby Show again this Wednesday. Brother Bob and Bing's son, Gary, already have scored with the Groner this month. And tomorrow night, Bing's 14-year-old twins, Philip and Dennis, make their debut as a guest team. You'll hear the kids trying to sell Dad a membership in the Bing Crosby Fan Club, a scheme that backfires. And you'll hear some rare and wonderful singing. CBS cordially invites you to hear the Bing Crosby Show this Wednesday and every Wednesday over most of these same CBS stations. Now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. I spent half the night at the city morgue and police headquarters with Lieutenant Delaney, examining the body they found in the Charles River and trying to identify him. All the labels were ripped out of his clothes and the laundry marks were cut off. We were left with just his physical characteristics and fingerprints. The mug file didn't duplicate him, and the prints didn't check with anything in town. So they sent them to the FBI in Washington. I got to my hotel at 4 a.m. to get some sleep, and I got it. Three of the shortest hours worth I ever had. Dollar? I'll tell her when he comes in. Is that Bonner, Johnny? How would you like to be fired? Huh? Oh, uh, yeah, Mr. Bonner, sir. Uh, uh... Uh, what can I do for you? Turn up with 85 mink coats. What have you been doing since yesterday? Sleeping? Uh, Bonner, I've, I've run my legs down to my knees, honest. I, I've been trying to find out something, anything. I, I, I've i peeked into so many corners, I've, I've got television eyes. And I've got a weak heart. Unless we find those furs in 24 hours, we have to pay off Elwood Faber, $300,000. Well, what are you going to do? Take it out of my pay? If we have to. We'll start by selling your body to a medical school. Please, Johnny, do something. Mm. Bonner... What's Elwood Faber's financial position? Triple A. Couldn't be better. They wouldn't steal him. How about the fur man, Stroganoff? He's always had money. Family. All right, Bonner. I'll keep after it. I'll call you when I get something. Johnny, don't take my shouting personally, but this is a big one. Give it everything you got. I forced myself to get out of bed, take a shower, and get my clothes on. I started for the door and had no idea where I was going. Aha, Mr. Dollar. When somebody did my thinking for me. To see you personally, I, Stroganoff, maestro of the Elwood Faber for department, am here. Do you have any news? News? Every paper in the country it should hit twice. Never in my 30 years of association with that foul little beast, the mink, has anything like this happened. What happened? You wouldn't believe me. Look, I'm pretty gullible. Well, it's incredible. I don't blame you for not believing me. Are we going to keep up this game, or do you tell me? Don't get huffy with Stroganoff. I will tell you. This morning, wrapped in dirty cardboard box, is arriving at the fur department. Guess what? A mean coat. Incredible? Incredible indeed. You mean one of the coats was returned by mail? Right. Well, that's, that's encouraging. I am not overjoyed. You still owe me for 84 coats. <laughs> Item, $1.90 for cab fare to Elwood Faber. It didn't make any sense. 
that the men or man who committed murder to make the heist would return anything. But one coat had come back. And in the pocket, I found a small piece of slick cardboard. It was only a third of an inch long, but there were three words on it. Country Club Dance. I was lucky. The country club secretary had a guest list, and one name on it stuck out like the nose on Jimmy Durante. Patricia Reedy. Yes? Oh, Miss Reedy? Yes. Who, who are you? My name's Johnny Dollar. Your uh, father is employed at Elwood Faber, isn't he? That's right, but I... Is he in now? Well, he's probably in bed. May I help you? Well, I don't know. I, uh... I saw you at the country club dance the other night. Oh, were you there? Oh, I couldn't keep my eyes up there. Especially... Especially when you... That mink coat on. The mink? Well, I... I uh, talk with this guy, Pat. What do you want, Dollar? Some information. Uh, Patty, will you make some coffee or something? All right, dear. Anything wrong? Oh, nothing I can't handle. Okay, Dollar, what are you doing here? Who asked you into my house? My job. I came to find out about a mink coat that showed up at Elwood Faber this morning. Look, uh, let's go out in the hall and talk. Okay. All right, Reedy, let's hear it. Now, don't go into a long song and dance. I'll tell you everything. Just the way it was. And I'd be real interested. The way I figure it, you helped in the theft. You maybe even killed Cronin. You kept one of the coats, but you got scared you might be caught with it, so you sent it back. Your daughter left the dance ticket in the pocket. All right. Here's the story right down the line. I didn't help in the heist. I had nothing to do with it. I didn't even know what was happening. Like I told you, I was in my office listening to the radio. Tell me, Reedy. You ever been arrested? Well, Dollar, you're smart enough to find it out sooner or later. I served time, sure. Might as well know. Lots of them. Elwood Faber would be interested to know a trusted watchman served time. Well, what'd you expect me to do when I got out? Curl up and die? I gotta live, too. I'm straight now. I... Well, almost. I had a wife and a kid. Wife died. You've seen the kid in there. Thirteen years of her life, she had nothing. But now I'm trying to make up for that. Everything I do is for her, not for me. What about the coat? Sure, I took it. I borrowed it. Before the safe was locked up for the night. I've been borrowing stuff right along. Whenever my kid needed anything. I always return them in good shape. Told Pat they let me do it. She don't know nothing. That's kind of a strange philosophy. I don't even know how to spell philosophy. But I do know this. That girl in there has a life ahead of her. Her mind's behind me. I got to give her every chance I can to look good, to act good, to use her brains, to meet the right people and go to the right places. Not just for dough, you understand. A millionaire husband. Just for a right guy and a, and a fair crack at happiness. Uh-huh. Ah, oh, you guys are all the same. You work from a little book, printed directions. Everything's black and white in life. Nobody's human. Oh, uh, well, that's that. I don't know what you're going to do. But I hope it don't blast that kid's life to pieces. Reedy, you should have thought of this a long time ago. I don't want any lectures. You'll shut up and you'll listen to me. I think I believe you. You're right. Maybe we do work from printed directions a little too much. Well... I can use a little judgment on my job. I think, for now, I'll forget everything you've told me. And forget where that coat came from. Go on back to bed. Go on, Reedy. Well, I didn't expect that from you, Dollar. Reedy, I know what bad breaks are like, too. Oh, I... 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 Oh, come on, come on. Look, you'll, you'll have me doing that in a minute. Hey, Dollar... I don't go in for this stool pigeon stuff. I never have. Well, now I see it another way. It doesn't matter what you tell as long as you tell it to the right guy. What does that mean? I'm going to give you something. It'll take them at least 24 hours to identify the guy they found in the Charles River. A picture in the paper this morning. Well, I can tell you right now who he is. Who? Who is he? Ted Gray. Worked in Elwood Faber about six weeks. Was fired two weeks ago. How do you know? Oh, I, I just know. <laughs> Personnel at Elwood Faber confirmed Ted Gray had worked there and was fired for insubordination. His address was 1432 Parkhurst Avenue, and I was over there in 15 minutes. It was an ordinary, undistinguished apartment house. No one answered when I knocked at apartment 12A. The door was unlocked. Except for the furniture, the room had almost nothing to offer. I poked around for half an hour before I saw the phone numbers written on the wallpaper next to the phone. There were 14 numbers, and I started calling them right down the line. The first seven produced such things as... Ling Chi Chinese Hand Laundry, the Happy Hour Liquor Store, and 
several other things that didn't have the particular information I needed. On the eighth call, I got the result. Hello? Hello. Is Harry there? Uh, Harry? Uh, Harry who? Harry Gordon. But I'm sorry. You must have the wrong number. Oh. Sorry. That's quite all right. Maybe he didn't know Harry, but I knew him. At least his voice. I called Lieutenant Delaney and told him where I was going. It was dark by the time I got to the Middleton Safe Factory. There was a single work light spreading a sickly yellow glow over the main floor of the loading platform. There wasn't a sound when I entered. That was too good to last. I went off somewhere in the darkness, and I dropped behind a medium-sized safe and waited for a gun flash. Cover! Johnny Dollar! What are you doing here? Looking for 84 mink coats, Middleton. I thought that was you on the phone, Dollar. How much money do you miss? Not much, but save your breath. You're going to need it to run. A man of your talent could do a lot in South America. With a hundred powerful and a business. I could never remember all those Spanish verbs. Thanks. Have you got anybody coming? Lots of people, Middleton. Lots. If I hit you, how would I know you weren't a prisoner? You know, I'll never give up. <laughs> And you'll have to shoot better than that. Ah, uh, you me ten feet. Oh, my windage screw is off. Is that the thirty-two you used on Ted Gray? No, this time I have a Luger. Let you work. Like a first time. Oh! Come on! That Luger didn't help you much, Middleton. Of an ignominious scheme. Yeah, you blew a good light. Uh, I could never find what I wanted. Look, I know why you kicked the watchman over, but why your own boy, Gray? He was in on this deal with me. He held out a coat for himself. Uh uh-uh. uh, that shows you how wrong you can be. It wasn't Ted Gray. You see, Middleton. Oh. Dollar! Over this way. Yeah, you've been shooting up the town, Dollar. Now, what's this? Jessup K. Middleton, he's your boy. Yeah, boy, for what? For the fur heist and the bodies at the morgue. Well, how do you know? Well, there's a safe full of furs on its way to South America somewhere. If you hurry, you might stop it at the port of New York. Well, why would he kill the guy in the river? And who was that guy? Ted Gray. He was the man who cased the Elwood Favor job. He reported 85 coats ready to go. And when only 84 showed up, Middleton thought he was holding back on it. Well, okay, Johnny. Thanks for doing all the work. I was just lucky, Delaney. You sure were. You could have been hit where it hurt worse. Come on, let's have the ambulance doctor look at that shoulder. This is the only way to live. Miss Reedy, you... Make it. Pat. Pat. You know, you're great on your feet. Well, what about you, Johnny? Dancing with your arm in a sling. Well, I, uh... I took the no-hands course at Arthur Murray's. <laughs> Pardon me, Mr. Dollar. There's a phone call at your table. Oh, thanks, lady. Come on, Pat. Johnny Dollar. Ted Bonner, Dollar. Bonner? Uh Uh-uh. I won't take another job for at least a week. No, it's not that. What is it? Are you afraid I'll put a night out on the swindle sheet? You aren't finished. Not finished? Hey, you got the coats, didn't you? Yeah, we found the safe down at the dock. Caught it just before it was loaded for South America. There were 84 coats in it, all right. But you know the one that was sent back in the mail? It's been stolen again. One's still missing. Oh, really? Oh, Oh, that. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, Bonner, somehow I, uh, I have a feeling that last coat will be in the mail tomorrow. Are you sure? Positive. So long, Mr. Bonner. So long, Johnny. Who was it? Oh, nobody important. You know something, Pat? You look just grand and mink. Well, the coat did show up the next day and in the mail. Maybe she'll have one of her own someday. Me? I stuck around Beantown for a few days to get a better look at at the Bunker Hill Monument, Paul Revere's home, and her deep blue eyes. 
which, uh, which began hinting at wedding bells. So, expense account item, eleven seventy-five back home, but fast. Expense account total, $384.16. Yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and was written tonight by E. Jack Newman and John Michael Hayes with music by Leith Stevens. Featured in our cast were Harry Bartell, Joseph Kearns, Hans Conrad, Bill Johnstone, Howard McNear, and Gloria Blondell. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. Join us next week when Edmund O'Brien returns in another transcribed adventure of... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. If you've got a piece of string handy, you better tie it around your fingers so you won't forget to file your income tax return. The deadline is March 15th, you know, and March 15th is right at hand. So to avoid penalties, file your returns promptly, but don't be in such a hurry that you forget to sign your name or attach your withholding statement. Now stay tuned for The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where you meet Gene Autry every Saturday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Well, I enjoyed this one. Howard McNear, of course, great anytime he's on uh, Johnny Dollar. And this episode uh, just does feature some really solidly uh, characterized uh, characters. Uh, Most were not in focus for a lot of time, but they're really uh, well-written and fun and have different voices and approaches. Uh, I did particularly like Johnny's uh, relationship with the lieutenant, which really did strike a good balance. Uh, Oftentimes, on these shows, either the policeman is... uh, you know, he's, you know, a old friend of the detective and, you know, lets him take a ton of liberties or he's uh, incompetent or he's just one of those, this is police business, you stay out of it. I, I like the way the lieutenant is written in this one. It's different. You know, he's really professional. He's friendly, but he's still firm. He's like, okay, now you're clear on this that uh, you are investigating the theft of the furs. We're investigating a murder, so you need to keep that in mind, but not being overly menacing or throwing his weight around. So I really did like the way that was played there. It was just a really uh, interesting approach to it. I also liked uh, the way that Johnny did end up handling the... uh, one coat that the robber didn't take. Uh, you know, it does show a nice little bit of humanity, which with Edmund O'Brien's take, uh, particularly at this point where it can be, you know, very uh, hard, uh, I think is just a nice little touch in this. All right, well, uh, listener comments and feedback now. And I have a question here regarding the Charlie Wilde uh, series from Eileen. Eileen writes, hello, Adam. I was curious if you were planning on getting this radio show from NBC next. Uh, Well, thanks so much for the question, Eileen. Um, As far as I know, there are no actual episodes of Charlie Wilde available. Uh, Charlie Wilde was a series that followed the cancellation of The Adventures of Sam Spade. And there was a television version of it as well. 
Uh, but I'm not aware of any radio or television versions of the program out there. So it's really hard to evaluate if it even be, you know, worth playing if it was. And there are some of those series, you know, it, it's frustrating when you get a good series and there are only one or two episodes. But there are some where there's just nothing available, but we do know by reputation that it existed. Uh, probably, you know, the ones I'm most interested in would be Scotland Yard starring uh, Basil Rathbone. And then there was a series called The Sheriff. I've, I'd heard ads for it on Abbott and Costello, but uh, no actual episodes available. So, yeah, unfortunately, Charlie Wilde falls into that situation. But thank you so much for the question, Eileen. And I do want to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to thank Robert. Robert's been one of our Patreon supporters since February of uh, 2019, currently supporting us at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Robert. And that will actually do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for Dragnet, and then we'll be back next Friday with another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter, Radio Detectives, and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.